Good morning and welcome to our services. Uh, if you're visiting with us, if you look into the pew in front of you, there should be a yellow card if you don't mind uh, filling that card out and as you leave, place it in the basket as, as you leave the building that's on the table by the exit doors. I have uh, some people that are sick and out of town this morning. Uh, Mary Minders uh, is in hospice at this time. Uh, Gig and Louise are at home as well, sick. Uh, out of town, uh, Bonnie Lilly and Tracy Walker, Keaton Walker, Patrick and Holly Windhorst, and then we have an area over here that's vacant. Uh, Kayla and Kevin Smith, Patrick and Marla Mitchell, Linda Smallman, Steve and Paula Foss, Heather Foss, uh, and I may have left someone out there, I don't, but uh, they're all out of town. Uh, visiting a grandbaby and a new member of the family. The ladies class has been rescheduled for February 28th at 10 o'clock here at the building. Is there anything else we need to announce? <coughs> Serving this morning on audiovisual is David Griffin. Our reading will be by Canon Ford. The uh, song leader is Ron Griffin, our opening prayer by Tim Smith, and closing prayer by Charles Webb. Rusty will have the lead for the uh, Lord's Supper. Mike Redman will have the prayer for the bread. Parker Windhorst for the cup. And preaching this morning is Car Carlos Valenzuela.
The Lord is my light. Following this song, we'll be led in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we're grateful for the night's rest and for the safe passage here this morning and we pray that everything that we say and do today will be in accordance with your will. We're thankful for Carlos and men like him who are able and willing to get up and to teach the truth and we pray as listeners and disciples that we will take these lessons and apply them to our everyday lives that we may better serve you. We have many of our congregation that are traveling today and we pray that you be with them and grant them safe passage and also we have many that are sick and loved ones and friends. 
we're especially mindful, mindful right now of the Minders family, and we pray you be with them and grant them peace and, and strength. We also, you pray be with our shut-ins, and, and uh, we pray that you be with Tullis, too, at this time, that he can continue to improve and be back with us soon. We, we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we become aware of sin, that we, we repent of it, and we pray that you will forgive us when we do. Most of all, we, we thank you for, for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross, that we may have forgiveness of our sins. And, and we, thank, we pray that everything we'll, we do, as the singing, the prayers, the Lord's Supper, again, we pray all things will be done in your will, according to your will. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, come share the Lord. <clears throat> Coming in this morning and walking in the building from being the teens low 20s outside and walking in here to 70 degrees we think you know how how blessed we are to be such in a comfortable building you know cushioned seats and and uh, perfect atmosphere and and you know in, in our own lives we we sometimes put a maybe even too much focus on making our lives easy and comfortable uh, you know physically and you know we we don't like to take ourselves out of our comfort zone as far as maybe even who we spread the the gospel to you know we might even pick and choose because we may not want to spread it to somebody that's gonna to reject us or 
criticize us or or uh, so we kind of maybe even uh, take comfort in who we we do things like that with but you know this morning this time we 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 take uh, we take a moment and we and we remember that great sacrifice great sacrifice that someone that was that that teachings and examples showed us that you know uh, our comforts not here on earth but our comforts in heaven and you know and, and by his example not only by his teachings he showed us that you know sometimes you got to be willing to to give up you know in his case everything on earth you know for for the eternal life and not just his eternal life but he, he give up the comforts on earth he spread the word to people that rejected him to people that not only rejected him but but took action against him physical action for his teachings but he was willing to do that not just for himself but he's live, willing to do it so we may all have the chance of eternal life in heaven so when we partake of these emblems this morning let our focus be on our great Lord and Savior who died and suffered on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. <clears throat> Bow with me. Our God and Father, we thank you at this time for allowing us to be here. We pray that you be with us now as we remember the death of Jesus on the cross, Father. We pray your blessing upon this bread, which to us represents his body, that he came to earth, suffered life, and suffered the cross, giving it giving up his body so that we can have a hope of heaven have something to look forward to in this life and ultimately be better Father we pray that you be with us at this time help us do this in a, in a mindset in a manner that's pleasing to you Father and we thank you so much for his his gift and his sacrifice and we pray Lord that you we never take it in vain, Father. We always remember it every day, every hour. We ask you always forgive us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, please bless this cup, which represents your Son's blood who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray that we partake of it in a way that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you'd care to stand, we'll sing about the mansion that we have reserved for us, this great dwelling place, eternity, with our God. <clears throat> very blessed to have another day that the Lord has provided to us to have an opportunity to worship him in spirit and in truth. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know that you are truly our welcome guest, that we invite you back at every opportunity that you have to come to worship the Lord again with us. To the brethren here, 32nd Street Church of Christ, you are loved, you are appreciated, and let us continue to go throughout this community, shining our lights and being the guides that God has called us to be. A scriptural text on this morning is going to come from the book of John. The chapter is 4 and the verses are 1 through 15. John chapter 4, and we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had passed through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near a field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, 
so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. We see in our scriptural text that Jesus arrives in a town of Samaria called Sychar. And after sending away his disciples to buy food, he has this interaction that we read about with this Samaritan woman. This woman walked a great distance to and from the well for a crucial element that we all understand is necessary to sustain life, that element being fresh water. In our world, we have both fresh and salt water, and we understand the importance of fresh water. We cannot live without it. Fresh water keeps us hydrated. It promotes healthy living. And the average, the average human can go a little more than three days without it. But there are also times where too much water of any kind can be a problem. We understand that uh, with seawater, with salt water, you know, you can't consume too much of that. We understand that that's even the case with fresh water. You know, there's a, a daily amount, uh, a su suggested amount of fresh water that we should be consuming. But if you far exceed that amount, that can be very dangerous as well. So we can consume too much water and we can also find ourselves being in a position where we are surrounded by too much water. And when we think about the idea of drowning, there are two forms of drowning that I want us to consider. Literally drowning, which is to die by suffocation from being underwater, or figuratively drowning, which is to have something in abundance. And when I think of figuratively drowning, as in having something in abundance, I think of Scrooge McDuck, the old cartoon where he dives into a swimming pool of, of golden coins. You know, so we have this idea of physically drowning, and then we have this idea of figuratively drowning. But with these things in mind, this morning, we are going to be studying the subject drowning in salt or living water. Drowning in salt or living water water. And the first thing that I'd like to bring to our attention regarding this topic on this morning is the idea of drowning in salt water, otherwise known as an ocean of sin, which we will uh, see that here in a little bit. We must understand that there is an abundance of salt water on the earth. Almost three-fourths of earth is covered in water. 97% of that water is salt water. So, the fact that we have all of this water, this salt water, of what advantage is salt water to man? Well, some have said that uh, sea water can have a number of benefits on one's skin and that sea water activities can improve conditions such as asthma and other lung related issues. And that being around or in seawater can have certain benefits for uh, particular aches and pains as well. But of all this seawater and the potential benefits of being in and around it, of what benefit is consuming salt water? Well, the answer to that, as we all know, is none. There is absolutely no benefit in consuming water from the sea. In fact, in doing so, it can be quite damaging and even deadly. If someone were stranded in the ocean, it is ironic that they would eventually die of dehydration even though they are surrounded by water. You see, as humans, we can safely digest small amounts of salt. But the salt content in seawater is a lot higher than what can be processed by humans. So salt water is not good for the human body, and yet the world is covered in it. And just like there is an abundance of salt water on the earth, there is also an abundance of sin. And every accountable person has found themselves drowning in this sea of sin. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 records that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God at one time destroyed the world because of sin. And mankind went right back into the conduct that led to that destruction. And it wasn't long before the world was yet again covered in sin. As we know, being in this world, but not of this world, the world lives in sin. The world boasts about sin. It advertises sin. And it proudly and boldly flaunts sin. 
And even though we may not have been proud of the sins in our lives, as so many we see are very proud of the sins in their lives, we were in the same dangerous position that sin puts everyone who is living in it in. Man, as we understand, was not meant, man was not created to live in water. We do not have the bodies to exist in water. We cannot spend uh, great periods of time in water because we are terrestrial beings, meaning we live on land. You know, growing up, I've always liked, you know, marine life. I've always liked sharks and whales. And and it's funny, Robert just had a a book fair and Arlene and I kind of knew in the back of our head what book he was going to come home with. Um, But we were like, maybe he'll get something else. But sure enough, he came home with the shark book. Um, But, you know, that was me at that age, too. I mean, I I love sharks and I've seen many documentaries about, you know, marine life. And there was one documentary that I was watching. And in this documentary, they were talking about mermaids and what a mermaid would have to look like. And and it doesn't resemble anything like a human. You know, a mermaid would have to have a very thick layer of blubber for them to survive. Something that we as humans do not have. We do not have the lung capacity to survive in water for long periods of time. Our senses, uh, our seeing, hearing, smelling, and tasting, these are all severely impaired while we are underwater. We do not have gills. We do not have webbed feet or webbed hands. So we are not created. God did not design us that way. We can be around water. We can be in water, but we were not created to live in water. And just as man was not created to live in water, Man was not meant, nor was man created to live in sin either. Yet, every accountable soul in this room, every accountable soul in the world, we're beyond the point of living in it, and we are all point, at one point in our lives, we're all, in fact, drowning in a sea of sin. You see, God made us in His image. He made us to glorify Him. And in breaking God's law, which is what sin is, We do not bring God any glory. So drowning and dying in sin was never a part of God's plan for us. God created a plan. He created a way for us to be rescued from sin before the foundation of the world. Yet the majority of people fail to be rescued from such a position because the majority of people ignore the rescuer. As we all know, sin is all around us. And many people don't mind swimming in it. Many people have become acclimated to its harsh harsh conditions, not realizing the damage that's being done. You know, you can research and you can find lakes throughout the country, throughout the world, that at one point were very popular places but had to be shut down because of the chemicals that maybe were released in them or because of uh, something that was harming, that's harmful to the body. Nobody nobody is in these places anymore. Nobody goes in these contaminated lakes. But it's ridiculous how people have become acclimated to these harsh conditions and they don't realize what sin is doing to their lives and what sin is more importantly doing to their souls. So why would someone seek to be rescued When they do not believe they are in a dangerous position. It makes me think about Peter. When Jesus was walking on the water, Peter said, Lord, if it is you, allow me to walk towards you. And Jesus said, come. So Peter's walking on the sea, but, you know, he loses sight of Jesus. And as a result of losing sight of Jesus, he calls for help. And it says that Jesus immediately took hold of him and helped him up. And that means that Peter immediately took hold of Christ as well. You see, Peter immediately took hold of his rescuer. But there are a majority of people who fail to do just that. Now, I want us to also consider the source of fresh and living water. Have you ever wondered what would happen if it stopped raining? If it stopped raining, there would be massive droughts all over the world. You know, when I was in Arizona... I worked at a property that had uh, several pools. We had four pools at one property. And every morning we would have to go, almost every morning we would have to go and we would have to examine the pools and we would have to make sure that the chemicals were at the right level. But one thing we also had to do almost every morning was fill the pools back up to a certain level because a lot of that water evaporated. You see, water evaporation 
uh, happens at over 100,000 cubic miles annually. Over 100,000 cubic miles every year evaporates from uh, our waters, from the ocean, from lakes, from rivers, from all of these uh, different places. So it wouldn't be long before the world was without water. Fresh water would cease to exist without rain clouds, and rain clouds without, would cease to exist without the God who provides them for us. We need the rain to physically survive. And even more necessary for our survival is Jesus. This woman, like all humanity, needs Jesus as he is the source of what is truly essential. And the water that Jesus provides is likened to fresh water, but he goes beyond fresh water and describes it as living water. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You see, the woman was not at the well drawing up salt water. She was at the well drawing up fresh water. Fresh water is water that is fit for human use. But there is a very limited amount of fresh water on the earth. We, we discussed that 97% of the earth is covered in water. Uh, it, uh, excuse me, three-fourths of the world is covered in water, but 97% of that water is salt water. So that leaves 3% that makes up fresh water. And of that 3%, two-thirds of it is locked up in glaciers and ice caps and in snowy mountain ranges and is therefore inaccessible for human use. So when it all boils down, we have access to about 1% of Earth's water available to us for our daily needs, which again shows how dependent we are on the rain to replenish our fresh water, replenish our lakes, our rivers, uh, all of this, these fresh water sources. But not even all the fresh water that is available can be consumed. Some of it is polluted. Some of it is dirty. Some of it is contaminated or just unpurified. Some of it is used for other things like uh, electricity and, and things of this nature. But Jesus says that the water that he provides is living water, which would usually be referring to flowing or running water like that of a stream or that of a spring. But even if Jesus was referring to literal flowing water, which he is not, but even if he was, it would have been better than the water that this woman was drawing up from the well in our scriptural text. The living water that Jesus is referring to is far greater than physical water. And Jesus does not come out and say exactly what that living water is. But we can speculate based off of the words of Christ and, so, and what he can provide. An argument can be made that that living water is righteousness. We see in Matthew chapter 5 and the verses 6 that Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So an argument could be made that it is righteousness. Uh, an argument could be made that it is eternal life, as we know that that is something that only Jesus can offer, something that only he can provide. But again, these are just speculations. The one thing that we can infer is that this living water that Jesus provides to those who come to him will keep us, will keep those who accept it from being spiritually dehydrated. And without knowing Jesus, there is no access to this living water. I want us to notice how the interaction between Jesus and this woman begins. Jesus asks for a type of relief. Jesus asks the woman for a drink of water. He is physically thirsty. He again is 100% man, 100% God. And being 100% man, he felt things like thirst and hunger. So Jesus is thirsty and he asks for this type of relief in order to speak about a greater relief that he offers. He makes a request in an effort to have a conversation that this woman needed to hear. And in verse 15, after she is so compelled by Christ's description of the water, she says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. But the woman had no idea who it was that she was speaking to. She had no idea what the living water was that he spoke of. She did not realize that this was Jesus, the gift of God, that was speaking to her. Christ had said if she had known this, she would have asked him, and, she, and he would have given her the living water that he can provide. 
Brethren, Jesus has something for us. He has crucial information about his living water that we all need to hear. He has water unlike any that we have ever tasted and we are desperately in need of. And it is only through and because of Jesus that we have access to this water. And it is through Jesus that we can be drowning in spiritual water. This is the water that Jesus is referring to. This is the water that Jesus offers, this spiritual water. You see, Jesus makes clear that there is such a thing as spiritual water, and he is its only source. This woman that Jesus has this interaction with, she is heavily, physically, and materially minded. Jesus talks about running water. She talks about living water, and he thinks that she's referring to running water. She is heavily, physically, and material minded, just like Nicodemus was in John chapter 3. Jesus talked about the need to be born again, and Nicodemus did not understand it. Nicodemus said, can a man again enter his mother's womb and be born? But that is not what Jesus meant. Jesus was talking about something spiritual. This is just like the people, the people in John chapter 2. They were also physically and materially minded. When Jesus said to them that he would destroy the temple and in three days raise it up again, what was the people's response? They said, it's taken 47 years to build this temple. And you'll build it up, you'll destroy it and build it up in three days? Again, these people did not have a spiritual mentality. When man is consumed with and by this life, It keeps man from seeing things through spiritual lenses. Therefore, she did not understand the spiritual message that Christ was speaking of. But we can. We can understand the spiritual message that Jesus is delivering. You see, Jesus is using things like water and thirst to relay to us a greater message. Christ's desire is to move our minds from the physical to the spiritual. With physical water, no matter how much water we drink in the moment, no matter how quenched our thirst is, we will always need more. We can have an abundance and we can consume a great amount of water today, but that does not mean that we will not need water tomorrow. We will always need more water. Physical water can never permanently and truly quench the thirst of the body. It can only do it for a moment. But as temporary as it may be, physical water does have an impact on the thirst of our body. But what Jesus provides has a greater impact on our thirst spiritually. Again, I'll say that Jesus, what Jesus provides has a greater impact on our thirst spiritually. Drinking physical water will keep us from dying physically. But drinking spiritual water keeps us from dying spiritually. And it is because of Christ that we have an abundance of spiritual water available to us. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the message. This is what we must grasp from this text. That what Jesus has, we can have in abundance. This spiritual water that he is speaking about, the spiritual water that he provides, it is available to us and it is available to us in great amounts. So much so that it is as if we are drowning or we can be drowning in it. Physical water will eventually cease, whether it be by man's uh, consumption of it in a particular area or when Christ returns. But physical water will come to an end. Water, like everything else in creation, is subject to to space and time. And as long as God sees fit for creation and everything in it to remain, the universe will continue to remain. But the universe was not meant to last forever, just as long as it takes God to accomplish his will. But we must understand what Christ offers, the spiritual water. That water is not subject to time and space. He offers us something different and better from anything and everything that we can acquire in this life. And it is only through Jesus that we can have a source of constant spiritual satisfaction. Jesus offers us something that is going to satisfy our soul continually. Nothing on earth here satisfies for very long. 
Water quenches our thirst, but we will be thirsty again. Hunger satisfy, uh, food satisfies our hunger, but we will be hungry again. What Christ has and what Christ offers has the ability to continually satisfy our spirit and will continue to replenish our soul. When we think about a spring, a spring is a natural outlet from which groundwater flows to the surface. And if you've ever seen a spring, it continues to run as if it's never ending. But it is Jesus, it is through Jesus that we have found the source of a new life that never ends. And just like it's smart to stay close to a source of drinking water, it is even smarter, it is even wiser to stay close to the source of eternal life. You know, we, we are very privileged in this country. We are very privileged to the fact that we, we don't have to go far to get water. We can go to the store and we can buy cases and cases and cases of water for relatively cheap. 40 bottles of water for $3. We can go and we can get access. We have access to all of this water around us. But there are places in the world where people do have to do just what this, women, this woman did and walk a great distance to have good, clean, healthy drinking water. And it is wise being in those positions, not to be far from it. So that way you always have access to it. But it is even wiser for us to put the emphasis that we should on the eternal life that Jesus provides. We must stay and remain close to him. I want us to ask ourselves this question. Do we realize the importance of what it is that Christ is offering? You see, it is only when we realize and take what Jesus provides that our thirst can be quenched spiritually. That we can th no longer thirst for what it is that we need, knowing that Jesus himself can provide it. Or are we so physically and materially minded that we cannot see things from a spiritual point of view? We can either be drowning in a sea of sin or we can be drowning in a sea of spiritual water. And Jesus informs us, informs us he, he desires us to all choose the latter. He wants us to be drowning in that spiritual water that he can provide. He does not want us to be any more in the sea of sin. He does not want us to be drowning. When we think about it, we were really, we were on the verge of death just before Christ rescued us. We weren't there and it's not like we had a long time because we don't know how long we have on this earth. We don't know when Jesus is going to come again. So we were literally almost on our last breath when Jesus rescued us from sin. We should never desire to be in that sea again. We should never desire to be a part of a, a society, to be uh, living in a way that is contrary to the words of Christ. We should strive to, again, obtain and be drowning in this spiritual water that Jesus desires. Uh, that Jesus provides, rather. So where do you stand on this morning? Jesus provides something to us, and he provides it for a reason. And, and Jesus is coming again. So the reason he provides, what it is that he provides, is so that we can be ready for his return. And as Christians, we are ready for Christ's return when we are living the lives that he has called us to live. When we are no longer attempting to dabble in that sea of sin. When we are striving to not only be separated from that sea, but do our part to help others be rescued from it as well. I really appreciate what Brother Rusty had said prior to our partaking of the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we can look at people and we can say, you know, that these, we, we can not want to be rejected, so therefore we don't bring them the gospel message. But they are drowning in a sea of sin just as we were. They have not tasted that the Lord is good. They have not tasted the spiritual water that he provides. And that's why we have a responsibility to tell the world about it. We have a responsibility to help people be prepared for Christ's return. As someone helped us be prepared but with, for Christ's return by informing us of what thus saith the Lord. So if you are here and you are a Christian, understand that you need to be living the life that God has called all of us to live. God desires and God demands that we be held to a higher standard, his standard. And we should strive to help others find that standard as well. 
So if you are here and you are not a Christian, understand that you need to become one. You've heard God's word. Do you believe it? Are you willing to separate from sin? Sin has done nothing for you but create a separation between you and God. You must have a desire to give it up and allow the Lord to change your heart. Allow the Lord to be in your life by responding to the gospel call. You must be willing to confess Jesus to be the son of God, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and rise up to walk in newness of life. And as we said in our Bible class this morning, that is a crucial part of Christianity. You see, obeying the gospel is how we begin our walk with Christ. But remaining faithful is how we continue walking with Christ. And that is something that we all have to do. You have that opportunity this morning to either begin your walk with Christ by by obeying the gospel or getting things right, getting back on that right path by giving your life back to the Lord, repenting, turning away from sin, praying to God and asking him for forgiveness. And if necessary, asking for prayers on your behalf from your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Wherever you are on this morning, we ask that you make a wise hearted decision. While together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.
Thank you all who are here today. It was good to see you. And Heather, you have a blessed day. We've been good for you. And certainly, uh, the time we get together and we sing together and pray together and hear God's word, God is edifying. But the first day of the week is especially special as we commemorate the death of our Lord. Thankful that we have. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? Yes. Meeting at 5 o'clock. The Wednesday evening at 5 o'clock. Charles will be leading the prayer and we'll be dismissed. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for all the great blessings that Thou hast given us, Lord. Our homes, our families, an opportunity to come and to worship Thee. We pray that the things that we've said and done here today have been pleasing unto Thee, Lord. We're thankful for the living water that we have access to, Lord. May we also always consider that a blessing, Lord. We pray for those that have not named Thy name, Lord. We pray that they'll have other opportunities to do so. We pray for our sick. We ask that thou would be with them and, and heal them and bring them back to us. We pray for safety as we go to our homes. Go with us and guide us, protect us. Forgive us when we fail you, Lord. For this we ask in Christ's name, amen.